Judaism was conceived by God as a means to connect with his infinite essence. Since God is above time and space, there are many aspects in Judaism which require us to live with God above the physical boundaries of time and space. Three times every day when we pray the Amidah prayer anywhere in the world, we transport ourselves to the courtyard of the Holy Temple, facing the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh HaKadoshim. Every single day of our lives, we are biblically mandated to remember the exodus from Egypt, twice, once during the day and once during the night. However, merely reciting the exodus does not suffice. We are actually required to relive the experience that transpired 3,333 years ago. The fast of the ninth day of Av is unique in the sense that we are meant to transport ourselves to the past and relive the terrible destruction of both holy temples, the second almost 2,000 years ago and the first 500 years prior to that. At the same time, Jewish law requires us to also focus on the future of this day and live with the Messiah whose soul descends to this world on this day according to tradition so that in addition to being the saddest day of the year, it is also a holiday. And therefore, certain prayers that we say daily but omit on holidays because they bring us to sadness are also omitted on this day. In recognition of the joyous aspect of this day, today's video will focus on the Rebbe and the Messiah. Interestingly, the Rebbe's soul may have descended to this world on this very day. In 1901, Tisha fell out on Thursday, July 25th. Nine months and two days later, on Friday, April 18th, 1902, on the 11th day of the Jewish month of Nisan, the Rebbe was born. If you count from Av to Nisan, you will only get eight months, but that year was a Jewish leap year, and the month of Adar was repeated. The Rebbe took on the leadership of the Chabad movement on January 17th, 1951, the day of the yard site of his predecessor, Rabbi Yosef Schneerson, who passed away one year earlier. In his inaugural address, he stated that the focus of his leadership would be to do what it takes to inspire his followers to bring about the final redemption when the presence of God will be revealed in our physical world. It was clear to all his followers that the Rebbe was stating with certainty that we would greet the Messiah during his lifetime. The Rebbe passed away Saturday night, June 12, 1994. 27 years have passed since then and the Messiah has yet to be revealed. Many of the Rebbe's followers wonder what happened to the goal that the Rebbe set for himself on that Wednesday night in 1951 when he took on the role of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. This is a question that I will attempt to answer in this and the next video. In 1943, the Rebbe published a small booklet titled Hayom Yom, Today is the Day, containing brief insights for every single day of the year. As an introduction to this booklet, he detailed the lineage of the first Chabad Rebbe, Rabbi Schneir Zalman, back seven generations from the famed Maharal of Prague, Rabbi Huda Leib, who is famous for using his mystical powers to create a golem, a powerful, animated, anthropomorphic being, which he fashioned from clay to protect his community from violent anti-Semites. The Rebbe also noted that the Maharal was a descendant of King David. He thus clarified that the leaders of Chabad possessed the Davidic lineage, which made them eligible to be the Messiah. After detailing the lineage of the first Rebbe, he continued with a brief biography of the six Chabad leaders up to and including his father-in-law, the previous Rebbe. The booklet is read daily by most of his followers. In 1982, my friend Rabbi Michal Aaron Zelikson, together with some colleagues, prepared a brand new edition of the book with sources, footnotes, and other enhancements. Zelikson is a noted scholar who published several important works. For this new edition, the biographical sketches in the introduction to the book were updated to include all the Rebbe's projects and accomplishments up until that current year. Zelikson recorded under the projects of that year of 5742-1982 that the Rebbe initiated a campaign to unite all the Jewish people by engaging scribes to write Torah scrolls where each single letter would be written on behalf of one single Jew. There are only about 300,000 letters to each scroll and there are millions of Jews, so multiple scrolls would have to be written. The Rebbe explained that our sages say that the main reason the Second Temple was destroyed was because there was a lack of unity among the Jewish people. This idea appears in the Talmud in Tractate Gittin, page 55, and is traditionally read on Tishabov. Based on that, 
our sages say that the redemption cannot come unless the Jews are unified. As we say in the conclusion of the Amidah, three times a day, Barachenu avinu kulanu ke'echad, bless us God, together all as one. This is not as easy as it sounds, because Jews hardly agree on anything. The one thing that we all agree on is the importance of the Jewish Bible, the Torah, although we do not all agree on how to interpret it or to implement its teachings. The Rebbe's idea was that we all unite through something we all respect, which is the Holy Torah. After Zeligson's brief entry about this project, the Rebbe added the following two points. Number one, he, referring to himself, publicizes that the mitzvah of writing a Torah scroll is the last of the 613 commandments recorded in the Bible, in the book of Tvarim, chapter 31, verse 19. And being that it concludes the list of mitzvos, there are those that say that it has a special connection to the conclusion of our exile, the Kates. Number two, he, again referring to himself, publicizes that in several books this year, 5742, is the year of the long-awaited Kates, the year of redemption. In a note to Rabbi Zelikson in November of that year, the Rebbe wrote that the source to number one was the book Ben Ishchai. That book was authored by Rabbi Yosef Chaim of Baghdad, he died on August 30th, 1909. He was a leading Sephardic authority on halacha, a Jewish law, and a master Kabbalist. The source of point number two, the Rebbe said, was in the Chassam Sofer on the Bible. Rabbi Moses Schreiber, who passed away in 1839, is known by his main works titled Chassam Sofer. He was one of the leading rabbis of European Jewry in the first half of the 19th century. The problem is that both sources are very weak. The Ben Chai talks about the connection of the mitzvah of studying Torah with the end time, not the mitzvah of writing a Torah scroll. The Chassam Sofer does indeed mention the number Tuf Shin Mem Beis, 742, but he is not referring to the year Tuf Shin Mem Beis, the year 5742 corresponding to 1982. He is rather referring just to the number 742. He says that he has a tradition that the redemption would come in the year 5670, corresponding to 1810. He then points out that that would be 1,742 Tafshi Membeis years from the destruction of the Temple. It would seem like the, that the Rebbe knew from another source that 1982 was the year, but he did not want to reveal how he knew, so he pinned it on other sources, even though they were not real sources. The question is, why he did that. A bigger question is why he is telling Zeligson to add to his accomplishments of that year that he publicized in that year that it was indeed the time of the end when he actually never publicly said so. One could argue that the very fact that he is telling Zeligson to insert this in the Hayom Yom booklet, which is very popular, is itself the publicity he was referring to. But I believe this is a very weak possibility because although the booklet is extremely pop popular among the Rebbe's followers, nobody reads the introduction. In fact, a beautiful English edition of the Hayom Yom that was published in 2010 with many enhancements, they left out the Rebbe's biography entirely because nobody reads it anyway. The Rebbe did actually fulfill his commitment somewhat to publicize these two points but he did so pretty quietly. A week before the end of that year, 5742, he published a halachic essay about the mitzvah of writing a Torah scroll and how it is fulfilled nowadays. Eventually, this essay was published in volume 24 of Lakute Sichos, page 207. In footnote 66, the Rebbe referenced the Ben Ishchai. So he, he promised to publicize in the aforementioned note to Zeligson in the beginning of the year, but he waited almost a full year to do so and only publicized it very quietly in a footnote at the end of a long essay. Parenthetically, although I do not like to toot my own horn, I will do so anyway. Upon the encouragement of the Rebbe, I rewrote his essays regarding the mitzvah of writing a Torah scroll. The Rebbe edited my version and it was published this year in volume 40 of Lukute Sichos on page 292. Now, regarding publicizing the fact that in several books that year was the year of the Cates, the Rebbe fulfilled this very quietly. 
In a footnote, he added to an essay that was published in the beginning of January of that year for the weekly Torah portion of Vayechi. It appears in Lakutei Sichas, volume 20, page 234. There is a very interesting story behind this footnote, so sit back and relax for a few minutes. Anyway, you can't eat or learn or work till, till nightfall. We're going back to 1922, to the city of Reischer in southeast Poland. The rabbi of the city was a great sage by the name of Rabbi Elchanan or Chana Halbishtam. He was a great grandson of one of the greatest Hasidic rabbis of the 18th century, Rabbi Chaim Halbishtam of Tzans, who died in 1876. He was known as the Rebbe of Kalashitz and was murdered by the Nazis in 1942. The 20,000 Jewish inhabitants of Reischer, of Reischer were murdered as well. Today, there are about 200,000 people in the city, but practically no Jews. In this city, there lived an amazing young man by the name of Chaim Yehoshua Pshemish. He had recently married and was not even 20 years old at the time of the story. He had a beautiful voice and was often asked to lead the communal prayers to the delight of all the participants. Chaim Yehoshua had a burning love for his brethren and whenever there was anyone in need, he did whatever he can to help them. If there was a widow who needed funds to survive or an orphan to marry off, he went around the large city knocking door to door to raise the necessary funds. And if somebody was sick, he helped them get the best doctors. One time there was a Jew who was thrown in prison because he was unable to pay his rent. A large debt had accrued and a significant amount of funds were necessary to secure his release. Chaim Yehoshua tried his best, but he was still very far from the sum needed. He went to the rabbi, the Rebbe of Kalashitz, who was still known by the name of the community he led prior to becoming the Rabbi of Reischer. Chaim Yeshua asked his Rebbe for advice on how he could raise the necessary funds to help this poor Jew in prison. The Rebbe had an idea. It was the custom in those days in many villages that on Purim a simple Jew would be appointed as the Rabbi of the city for the day. He would dress the part and hold court, and people would come to him for blessings and advice. He would often deliver a sermon which was so silly, it was actually comical. The Rebbe advised that this Purim Chaim Yeshua would be appointed to this position, and it will be announced in the name of the Rabbi that whoever needs a blessing should come to Chaim Yeshua, give him some charity that he will distribute to the needy, and Chaim Yeshua's blessing will materialize. Chaim Yeshua was not very comfortable with this plan and personally didn't fathom how it could work, but he trusted his Rebbe and followed his advice. The plan worked amazingly, and in a short time, he had in his hands enough funds to secure the release of the poor imprisoned Jew. He promptly delivered the funds, and the Jew was released on that very day of Purim. After his mission was accomplished, he ran to his Rebbe with the great news that the man was now free and celebrating Purim with his family. The Rebbe was electrified with joy, and he gave the following blessing to the young Chaim Yehoshua. Just as you have brought me such joy by bringing me the great news of the release of one of our brothers from prison, I bless you that you will one day publicize the case, the end time of our release, the Jewish people from our long and bitter exile. Miraculously, Chaim Yeshua escaped the clutches of the Nazis with his wife Yehudis and all his children, five daughters and one son, and they came to America. He ended up living in a village of New Square, a short 10 minute ride from where I live. All his children built beautiful families and his descendants number in the hundreds. One of his grandchildren is my neighbor and another few are my friends. He passed away in 1988 at the age of 85, but it seems that the Rebbe's, his Rebbe's blessing that he would publicize the Cates, the year of the end, had not yet been fulfilled. But sooner or later, the blessings of a holy tzaddik always come to fruition. Chaim Yehoshua's only son was Yisrael Mendel who lived in Crown Heights and used to pray regularly in the Rebbe synagogue in 770. He passed away just last year on November 11th. Sometime in 1982, he got a hold of a book called Dvar Nitzav. This book was written by a holy and righteous Torah sage by the name of Naftali Tzvi Brach, son of the famous Rav Shol Brach of Kasho, a city currently in Slovakia near the southern border with Hungary. Naftali Tzvi was the rabbi of Magendorf and a relative to my neighbor, Yoeli Brach. He was murdered by the Nazis on Sunday, June 18, 1944. In 1975, a student of his published his book on the Bible. On page 115 of this book, he calculates the end time to the year 5742, 1982. His calculation is very interesting, but it's a little complicated for now. 
Yisrael Mendel Pshemish was very excited about this find and he sent it into the Rebbe. As mentioned, the Rebbe cites this book in a footnote to an essay published in January 1982. The exact words in the footnote, number 50, are A wise man brought to my attention that in the book titled Varnitzav, in the Torah portion of Toldos, he calculates the year of the end to 5,742, which again was that current year. The wise man he is referring to was none other than Yisrael Mendel Pshemish of blessed memory. The Rebbe had thus fulfilled the commitment he made earlier that year to Zelixin when he instructed him to insert in his biography in the preface of the Hayom Yom booklet that in the year 5742 he will publicize what it says in books that that year is the year of the end. Another commitment was also fulfilled with that footnote, the one made by another great tzaddik, the Rebbe of Kalashitz, 60 years earlier in the Polish city of Reicher. Abchaim Yeshua did not end up publicizing the end year, but the Rebbe of Kalashitz's blessing was fulfilled when his son sent this book to the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who in turn publicized it in a footnote. There is one other piece to this puzzle. We mentioned earlier the Rebbe's project of writing Torah scrolls on behalf of all the Jews in the world. On Shabbos Hanukkah that year, December 4th, the Rebbe held a fabreng in a public gathering. During these gatherings, the Rebbe would usually give about six or seven independent talks, each separated with a few minutes of singing and saying l'chaim. In the third talk, he said that he's very excited about a letter he received from overseas. He noted that he really should have held a special gathering just to share this insight. But being that nobody actually pays attention, it doesn't really make a difference. Nonetheless, he was very excited about it. At the end of the book of Daniel, in chapter 12, right before it gives the calculations for the end time, the prophet says, at that time, the great angel, Prince Michael, who stands over the people, our people, will arise. It will be a time of trouble, the likes of which has never been since we became a nation. At that time, our people will be speared, all who are found written in the book. This person suggested to the Rebbe that the prophet is referring to those who participate in the Rebbe's project and acquire a letter in one of his special Torah scrolls written to unite the Jewish people. That is the book that the prophet is referring to. They will all be spared from the horrors of the wars of Gog and Magog. What is interesting is that the Rebbe wanted to make it clear that this was not, this was not coming from him, but rather it was an idea suggested by someone else in a letter he received from abroad. What is very strange about this entire story is the fact that on the one hand the Rebbe wanted it to be known that 5742, 1982, was the year of the Cates, and that the Torah scroll project was related to this, but he didn't want people to know that it was he who knew this information, so he blamed it on different books and people. As we mentioned earlier, the Chassam Sofer, the Ben Ishchai, they really do not say that. The Rebbe did end up getting an unknown book from an author who was unknown, that does actually calculate that year as the year of the Cates, as we mentioned earlier, the story of the book of the Dvar Nitzav. But it is obvious that this was not the sole basis of why he asked that it be inserted in his biography as a significant accomplishment that he publicized that 5742 was the year of the Cates. He also only ended up publicizing it in a very quiet way by sticking it in a footnote at the end of an essay published later that year. I therefore would like to suggest the following. The Rebbe knew either through divine inspiration, Ruach HaKodesh, or he figured it out the same way we did. That in the 1290 years, at the end of the book of Daniel, are to be counted from the year 692, when the Dome of the Rock was completed. This is the abomination that Daniel is referring to, because the inscriptions inside and out of the Dome declare that our Torah is not eternal, God forbid, but that it was superseded by a new one in the 7th century. We actually mentioned this abomination in the prayer we recited last night, which begins with Zechoyer Hashem Meho Yelonu, Remember God what has happened to us. The very last stanza of that prayer, it says, Halhart Siyon Sheshomim Ki Nitan Olov Shikutz Vishoyimim. The Mount Zion is desolate and an abomination has been placed upon it. As we explained in video number one and two, verse 11 in Daniel chapter 12, which says the end time begins 1,290 years, corresponds to 1982. 
and the 1,335 years in verse 12 corresponds to the end of this 45-year window. The Rebbe knew this, but, but did not want to reveal how he knew it. The Talmud says it is forbidden to reveal the end time. One of the reasons is because if one reveals the end time too many years prior to its actual occurrence, it will cause despair and depression. Being that this was only the beginning of a 45-year window, he did not want to make a big deal about it. And he did not want to attribute this knowledge to himself so as not to violate the oath of the Talmud. So he pinned it on others and he did not really publicize it too much. However, he wanted to make sure that it was printed and published so that someone closer to the time of the end will figure it out. They will figure out that the 45 year period that began in 1982 will be coming to a close and that the time left for the coming of, the Mashiach, of Mashiach is very short. The Rebbe may have left us on the third day of Thomas, but he left us everything we need to know to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Interestingly, even though the edition of the Hayom Yom, which we were speaking about, was published in mid-1982, the date of the forward is the third day of Tammuz prior to that. I believe the Rebbe was giving us a hint that although he may be living, leaving us on the third day of Tammuz, he was empowering us in this very book with crucial information for the future, which is actually right now. Let us use this information wise, wisely and spend the short time left the, to be the best we can. Until next time, may God be with you.